Thank you so much, Abhrajita, um, especially for bringing us back to why we are here, what, what have we set to achieve, and uh, leaving us on such a hopeful note uh, that if not now, then when, uh, as Arunika had also pointed out through her quote. Um, I would now like to call upon uh, stage Kathleen Modrowski, who has served as the Dean of Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities since 2014. Um, she studied in the United States in France, where she received an advanced degree in cultural anthropology and ethnology of the Arab world at the School of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences. Her recent projects include developing, uh, developing human rights cities in Kenya, Mali, and India. She was invited to Ghana as a constitutional consultant on the National Constitutional Committee Human Rights Section. As a facilitator of human rights learning, Modrowski implements a participatory learning research model in planning and development of human rights cities framed in the concept that human rights are relevant to daily life. Kathleen has been a speaker on global education and multicultural learning in Africa, China, Korea, Singapore, India, and the United States. Her research includes human rights education, the right to health and tradi traditional medicine, and experiential education. Recent, re, uh, recent work is in the area of comparating, comparative pedagogies and education policy and development in India. Kathleen, we would love to have you to share that massive experience that you come with, the global experience you come with, and we would love to learn more about the challenges and learnings you've gathered throughout. Thank you, and it's good to see the audience from here in the front seat. I couldn't see who was here, so uh, it's nice to see all of you. Thank you so much for your stories, everyone. Uh, I just really am amazed at the stories for a number of reasons, too. Because having worked in many places in the world, I see that there are themes that really emerge in these stories, and that really, you know, bring people together. There is certainly the same spark, the same passion that I've seen in many other places. And it's only with this kind of passion, this interest, this dedication, that people really do succeed and stay with a very difficult choice that has been made by you throughout your, you know, that will continue throughout your lives. Um, this is a hard choice to make. But I think once you've made it, you're not going to be able to leave your decision behind and say, well, this was a lot of fun, but I'm going to go back to a more normal existence, a less passionate, a less demanding world. Uh, my own story is uh, pretty you know, banal, except there is something that's um, a little bit interesting in it. I was working as an anthropologist uh, collecting data for my thesis in Tunisia. So I would go out to, I was in an oasis village, which was near the Libyan border in Tunisia. And I would go from house to house, uh, you know, Bedouin camp to Bedouin camp, and I would listen to, uh, you know, what people's histories were, how they categorized their family history, where their travels have been, and especially what their aspirations had been for themselves and for their children. And one day the people, after they became quite familiar with me, a group came to me and said, you know, you're not the same as this other group who's coming around here and we don't like what they're doing. And the other group that was there was the WHO. They were collecting blood samples working with the Food and Drug Administration to see what was the effect of a lysine-enriched wheat in this community. But people were never really told what it was about, and so they're getting very upset because blood, you know, taking blood, extracting blood, uh, was associated with witchcraft, 
was associated with taking something very vile from people. And they also didn't know, people are not stupid, what the benefit was going to be. So who's this going to enrich uh, in your life? And I realized, you know, I'm doing the same thing. I'm kind of extracting something very important from people, but they don't really know why I'm doing it. So we talked about it. Uh, I tried to introduce the right people so that they could speak with the WHO uh, committee, and they created a form of their own organic resistance to the project. Whether this is going against science or not, uh, it was still very important that the people have a say in what was being done with their bodies, with their information. At the same time, I learned my lesson from this community of what am I doing taking this information that may never ever benefit anyone in the community. So I said, well, what would you like me to do? And they said, tell us what you're doing. So every Friday, this was, um, you know, after the mosque, I would have a talk with people. And when we did have electricity, I'd show uh, slides or I'd show pictures at the time that I'd collected from other places and tell them what I was doing and what information I was collecting. And this ended up being uh, very beneficial because I was Friday afternoon entertainment for people. But at the same time, they were able to tell me where I had it wrong. So I would give them an interpretation of the information I was collecting, what I was doing, and they'd say, no, 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 it didn't happen this way, or yes, this is the right way for it to happen. And this gave me the idea that actually uh, the way I like to work with research is being mm -hmm. inclusive, bringing people along with me, having them join in the project, and you know, letting them tell me what works, what doesn't work, where uh, they want their voices to be heard. So it's a question of creating multiple voices in a project, in a program. Uh, coming from this experience then, eventually, I'm gonna skip along a couple of years, I did start working with an organization called People's Movement for Human Rights Learning that set up human rights cities in 26 different locations. And this was, a, and it continues today, they launched, the, this organization also launched the Decade of Human Rights Learning. And I'll give you a little bit of the nuance in that term is that the difference between learning and teaching, the idea, and maybe some of you know this, learning is when you've created the knowledge yourself. It's become part of you. It's become part of your exchange of what you know, how you articulate it, and where you continue with the knowledge of other people. I'll give you a little example of how this human rights studies works, because it works with, on a different scale, in the way that you people seem to be working in telling your stories. It is based on storytelling as well. It's based on the notion that really we all have something to say. And it's based on the belief that whether you, you know, believe that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a Western construct, we also were able, through people telling their own stories, to have them say, well, this resembles such and such part of our belief or another belief. But uh, I was working as a facilitator in the human rights cities in Argentina in a town called Rosario. And there's a large population of people who are uh, the Indians, the tribal people who have moved into the area and who are probably the most economically deprived in that community. Now, the idea of setting up the human rights city was, number one, it should not be an official organization created by the municipality. For any of you who are going to continue with your work, uh, I think you'll appreciate the fact that when you have this top-down organization, it just doesn't work it's not going to work and the people are going to drop out or once an incentive, a monetary incentive is taken away. 
it's not going to continue anymore. So one the in the organization of the city of Rosario, there were lots of human rights problems. Uh, Argentina, if you recall, had come out of a very horrible military dictatorship. And this training of oppression still was very deeply embedded with people in the country. Uh, there was the idea of social change, but it was carried out more or less by the elite in the community. So the idea was how do we bring the Toba people, this is the tribal group in, but a very large community living in uh, a town that was made up of, you know, sort of <coughs> makeshift homes. Um, the kids there were not allowed to go to school. People were not allowed to go into the stores because everyone thought that they were going to steal something from the store. So the important part was to get the people together with various organizations. And these change organizations met together and the Toba people told their story. It became extremely powerful. So the whole campaign was centered a, around what the Toba people saw as their needs in the community, because it was realized their needs were extreme, the right to school, the right to health, the right to education, but there was something that was shared by everyone in this community. And the speakers from this community, they may not have been literate, they may not have been writers, were so powerful that they convinced this organization to stay uh, on track with their ideals. Because of them and because of their demands, there was an ombudsman for human rights set up in Rosario, which exists to this day. And the Toba people now have schools. The kids go to the schools. They have real apartment buildings. They're included in the healthcare profession. So this is skipping beyond a lot of the work that had to be done on the day-to-day -day basis by the people in the community. And that's just an example. I think you people can share with the examples from your own work, your own stories. But I want to finish with the idea of Walter Benjamin. I don't know if any of you know Walter Benjamin. He's, uh, he died in 1940, a German philosopher and uh, someone who believed very much in the power of stories. He said that the storyteller is the figure in which the righteous man or woman encounters himself, herself. And why is that so important? Because in telling your story, in constructing your story, you're reconstructing yourself. Then you're also getting at the idea of who you are, what the power is. Each time you tell your story, you're going to become more and more powerful. And you're going to share this power with other people. And by getting them to tell their stories, you're creating this unity so that it's no longer one single story, but it's the story of everyone. Uh, I'm going to finish with a quote that Benjamin also wrote about the storyteller, and I recommend everyone to uh, read Walter Benjamin. It's not really short. It's not long. It's about six pages long. And he said, the storyteller is the person who could let the wick of his or her life be consumed completely by the gentle flame that is his or her own story. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with that idea, and I hope you all continue telling your story, sharing your stories, and becoming a collective story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I think that was very, very insightful, especially, especially bringing us back to the fact that not always that the communities we work with are we part of that community. Yet, how do we ensure that 
we being outsiders make that process as participatory as possible and ensure that people's voices and their stories are at the center of any change making process that we are a part of so thank you for uplifting that through your stories um we have some time uh, as well uh, which means um uh, we uh, also want to open this space for change makers that have been around if you have any questions to ask a prajita to kathleen uh, any questions to ask, like open to the audience any comments you want to share so yeah any volunteers who want to go up does anyone want to ask anything does anyone want to share their story as well nitish lot of prompts for you huh, nitish <laughs> you seem to be very popular you want to share yeah we we can have a, yeah you can you can actually come here it will be very difficult for <laughs> you to turn around why don't you come here Hello everyone. Uh, my huge respect for entire Haya team and JSI for providing me this opportunity. This training program named People Power Change helped me a lot. Uh, my name is, as you know, Nitish Singh. Uh, I am not from this background. I am from a commerce background, and uh, I did my BCom from Delhi University. And currently, I am working with Wipro IT company. So this sector is very new for me. but while working with wipro i really love to work for social change and we all are the leaders for social change so in 2017 i established an organization promise for education foundation under this organization we are conducting survey in slum areas and jj colony type areas in delhi where we are counseling of parents and children and collecting data who are still deprived from education this is very surprising for us that in spite of government free education policy there are thousand of kids who are still not part of mainstream education so in 2018 uh, we did our admission campaign drive under this we admitted more than 100 kids into mainstream education by counseling their parents during this uh, campaign drive we also talked to school we also talked to community people and then we did apart from this we did counseling of more than 5000 people who are living in different slums of delhi so now over to this program uh, there are so many challenge that i faced with my team during this uh, campaign but when i attended this program people power changed i did not aware about some of the uh, names that now i know about public narrative how to organize project relationship building and how to build strategy successful strategy so uh, my humble request to all of you you are uh, if you find any child who are still deprived from education please inform us please inform our foundation we will do a uh, counseling will admit them in school and provide necessary support to continue their education their education thank you so much thank you nitish um we also have uh, one of our guest speakers here Uh, so essentially in the 10 week program the way it worked was uh, after the theory class we would also have um, experts from within the change making space who are trying different different kinds of techniques um, whole expertise in different kinds of methodologies who would come um, and of course share about their work and also leave the students with new questions and new ways of trying and uh, experimenting in their work so we have anand with us Uh, who is the founder of crowds new crowd musing uh, so if you want to come here and share some thoughts as to like why have you been here 
open the space for new ideas and thoughts that you've been having and anything that you learned in this journey. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we put you on this spot. Okay. So, firstly, people, power, change. Three elements, people, power, and change. So you're empowering people to empower other people. I guess that's the process which, uh, through which all of you went, and that's the key part of it. So you become voice of people, you work for other people, you do programs for them, you teach them. But I guess the most important thing is empowering them to create their own change, teaching them how they can tackle their difficulties, how they can tackle their problems and create a sustainable change. Because that's how it will be only sustainable. I mean, I work for someone, so I work on women's issues. But if a woman and a group of women are working on women's issues, that's much more powerful than I working on them. So a lot of times it's important to give the agency to the people who are there fighting for themselves. I guess the course, I mean, I went through the modules, I took a class and through all the experiences which everybody has been sharing here, that's a key element of change making which this course has completed. Okay, then. <laughs> okay, this is about the course for. Wait, do you want to do you want to share with us any of your successful stories of change making? Anything that Crowd Newsing has been doing? Okay, so I co-run an organization called Crowd Newsing. So initially the idea was, I mean, since 2014, the media has been destroyed completely, mainstream media at least. There's a huge control. So a friend of mine, Bilal Zaidi, he's an ex-journalist. I'm a campaigner. So we decided, okay, like, there's a time that independent news has to come up. So we decided to start an organization, but we didn't register an NGO. We registered a private limited company. So government has a lesser control on us, what we do. So our idea was to empower journalists to do stories which are important and not just the stories which the news cycle demands. So right now, organizations, media organizations won't support stories which don't attract more advertisements, basically. So it's an ad revenue-based model for television and as well as newspapers because majority of the ads are from the government. So there were a lot of journalists who were feeling helpless because there are stories which, needs, which needed to be told to people. So we started crowdfunding for journalists, basically. So that was the idea behind crowd newsing. So we did a crowdfunding drive for a senior journalist called Paranjoy Goha Thakuta, who was with the EPW. He was removed from a Adani story. And now he's been doing amazing work because he's independent. So there is a price you pay when you leave an organization, but there is so much you gain by being independent. So that was the initial part of it. But over a period of time, the way hate crimes were increasing in India, religious atrocities were increasing, we decided there's a need to shift our focus. So we reworked our basic aims and organization structure, and we decided, OK, there is a, uh, so our work then included not just media, but interventions. So we took on issues where interventions are necessary. So we created a legal fund for around five families who have been victims of uh, lynchings in India. So we help them raise money, so they're able to fight a legal battle. Otherwise, you know, there are lawyers who are willing to support pro bono, but that's, that will take the case still a limit. So there is money required for transferring a case from one city to another. So there are five families, five lynching cases, which we have been supporting right now. Then, I guess when we talk of power and change, a lot of it is a democratic process. So when our leaders are funded by corporations, there's no way that they will be account held accountable for working for people. So we had a lot of activists who contested elections, but most of them failed. So one of our friend, uh, Jignesh Mivani, a Dalit leader from Gujarat, so he decided to contest. And his aim was, other, I mean, even for someone like Jignesh, there were uh, big corporations who were ready to help because they need PR and branding. So he decided, you know, I won't take money from them because it's, so his slogan when we came, so you know, he, I mean, sometimes you do a lot of brainstorming, you talk to 100 people to decide a tagline for a campaign. And he called me up, he's like, he was, janta ki ladai, janta ke paiso se. So people's fight with people's money. So that was the campaign. I mean, I mean, obviously we did a lot of marketing, we did a lot of media around it. So we raised around 25 lakhs for his political campaign and he won. I mean, that was the most important part. So through that, then we intervened uh, when I read the news on writers that the Rohingyas will be deported. 
So, you know, I mean, there is a persecuted community which has, I mean, it's when people leave their homes, they don't leave it happily. I mean, I don't know anybody who's migrated to another country in terms of refugees that they're happy to leave the country because they had a threat to their lives, they came here. And the government, at the cost of inconvenience, wanted to send them back. So, I mean, I went to the refugee camp, I convinced two people, because I mean, I filing a petition in the Supreme Court has no ground because I'm not affected. So it took me around 20 days to convince two people to come with me. So I took them to a senior lawyer called Prashant Bhushan and he took up the case. And now January, I guess there's a final hearing of that case, but we have built a strong case in support of them. So, you know, also we have been, uh, why funding of independent media is also necessary that because we are living in a age and time where fake news is the news basically. So if you look at uh, fake news in terms of the Rohingya community, the news which you could see on television was a flux of Rohingyas, a flood of Rohingyas coming in India. The fact is it's 48,000 people in India, that's it. And that if you look at the population growth of India, it's half day population increase. So all the nonsense about how they'll be taking our raw resources, they'll be increasing crimes, it has no standing anywhere. So, okay. <laughs> so crowdfunding, so okay. Impact wise, we have raised around 2.7 crores in the last one year. So from independent journalists to interventions in democracy and the latest is the March, Farmers March which happened. We raised money for, not the farmers because they were organizations who supported them and managed everything but we are also working in terms of interventions, so there is a huge agrarian crisis in India and people don't know about it. The middle class, the urban India doesn't care about it. So there is an initiative by a veteran journalist P. Sainath to spread this initiative for Nation for Farmers. So once you make the middle class and urban India aware of the issues, then things might change. That's the hope we are working on with. <laughs> Thank you, Anand. Those are some really, really powerful stories and battles that you've picked on and uh, you were, you know, depriving us. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Jeremy? <laughs> I'm just picking people, putting them on the spot. So, j just a little, little background before Jeremy can speak. Jeremy, uh, our, our association with Jeremy has been really, really long. Even back in 2016, we did a project together and we've constantly coming back, no, we should do something again, we should do something again. We've just held strong. And I see this just going stronger and stronger with more years to come. And of course, growing much bigger at scale. So yeah, Jeremy, please tell us something. Anything will be good <laughs> about your work. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't prepare anything, but I'll share a few thoughts. I mean, first, I just want to thank everyone for coming. And I want to thank the Hyatt team who inspire me continuously. Um, Repender, in particular, for the incredible amount of passion to make this project happen, make this program happen over the last, I think, year. And um, for all the change makers, uh, incredibly inspired by those I interacted with briefly in the sessions and also hearing the stories today. I actually would have, and if we have time and if you feel courageous, I'd love to hear you know, those who didn't speak uh, a little bit more. So I encourage you to do that if we have time. Um, for me, you know, maybe I'll share a little bit. You know, what got me motivated to work in social impact actually came when I was in my first job working at the U.S. Treasury Department, uh, I really related to your story uh, working in the government, by the way. Uh, but while I was there at the U.S. Treasury Department, I started in 2008, right when the international banking crisis started, global financial crisis started. And I worked, and to one point is that just shook a lot of people's reality, mine included, about what finance does in the world, good, bad, how you viewed that. But over the years, it really crystallized in my mind, seeing how the banks were recovering quite healthily, how large 
companies, the CEOs were recovering, but people. And I would travel often to small towns in the U.S. and interact with a local banker, the local loan manager, and hear the stories from the people. And it was actually my job to go in and tell them they had to you know, end the relationships with those customers, that they were too risky and that they had to, you know, which would, what I realized would end up bankrupting small companies, would end up, you know, creating all kinds of problems that happened in the years following the crisis. And I was in that role of doing that. And it just shook me that we really need a new system going forward. We need a new system that actually invests in people and you know, in building stronger communities. And it's not just based on the financial accounting ledger. You know, it can't just be that. And to me, everything since has been about trying to make that happen. And uh, of course, when I started, I thought I could do a lot more than I was able to do since <laughs> I started. But I, every day, this, this, dri this vision drives me, and I was inspired by your idea of thinking bold and thinking big, and I think I need to continue to do that myself. But what I really love about this program is that, you know, it's great to, when people get together and inspire each other in it. I think that's a really powerful thing. But it's also really important to get clarity and understand and organize what you're trying to do. So I think that's why this program is great, and I want hope to support it, hope there's more. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I would actually now want to move on to an interesting section that we had, especially for our change because Oh, okay. There's some. You want to share a story? Of course. Please. Please come. सभी को नमस्ते और मेरा नाम प्रिंस दुबे है और मैं फाउंडर हूँ कृषि विज्ञान नेटवर्क का हम पिछले पाँच सालों से कृषि एजुकेशन पे काम कर रहे हैं और मुझे लगा कि आज अपने बारे में यहाँ बता के मुझे काफ़ी गर्व होगा और काफ़ी अच्छा लगेगा और आप सबसे कुछ सीख के मैं यहाँ से जाऊँगा मैं अक्टूबर में माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी के मीटिंग में गया था इंडिया इटली टेक्नोलॉजी समिट तो मुझे माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी से मिलने का और समझने का मौका मिला तो उन्होंने एक चीज़ कहा था कि टेक्नोलॉजी इज़ लोकल बट साइंस इज़ यूनिवर्सल हम क्या आने वाले भविष्य के चिंताओं के लिए सोशल सेक्टर हो या किसी भी सेक्टर में अगर हम टेक्नोलॉजी पे काम करते हैं तो हम देश को दुनिया को और बेहतर बना सकते हैं तो मेरा यहाँ पर अपने अनुभव के बारे में साझा भी करना चाहता हूँ सवाल भी करना चाहता हूँ आप सबसे हम जैविक खेती पे एजुकेशन पे हैंड वॉशिंग पे काम करते हैं हम गांव गांव जाके बच्चों को हैंड वॉशिंग का तरीका सिखाते हैं उसमें आज 90 परसेंट बीमारी हाथ ना धुलने के कारण बच्चों में होती है हम सभी जानते हैं माननीय मोदी जी ने एक बात कही थी रिलायंस फाउंडेशन हॉस्पिटल के शुभारंभ में कि आज हिंदुस्तान में या पाकिस्तान में सबसे अधिक अगर बच्चों की मौत हो रही है तो वो हैंड वॉशिंग अच्छे से ना करने के कारण हो रही है तो उन्होंने एक चीज़ और कही थी कि हमें देश को यहाँ से शुरुआत करनी होगी हमें देश को यहाँ से ले जाना होगा इसी कॉन्सेप्ट को लेके हम काम कर रहे हैं पिछले कई सालों से हम किसानों के बीच काम करते हैं किसानों को जैविक खेती की ट्रेनिंग देते हैं किसानों को समझाते हैं कि वर्मिंग कम्पोस्ट जो होती है उससे आप अच्छे से खेती करें और जो हमारे थाली में भोजन आती है वो सब लोग स्वस्थ हो चुके हैं अच्छे रहें और मेरा सवाल अपराजिता मैम से है कि आने वाले सोशल सेक्टर में हम किस नीति पे काम करें किस थीम पे काम करें ताकि हमारा देश और आगे बढ़े क्योंकि बहुत सारी नीति होगी बहुत सारी थीम होगी लेकिन मैं आपसे दो थीम और दो नीति के बारे में पूछना चाहता हूं ताकि हमारा देश इतना ग्रो करे कि पूरे विश्व में हम सबसे नंबर वन बन सकें और सबसे नंबर वन का परिश्रम लहरा सकें या थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच
तुमसे पूछा है थैंक यू पहले तो शेयर करने के लिए पर क्योंकि तुम आपने मुझसे पूछा है तो अगर आप थीम बोल रहे हैं तो मैं कोई पर्टिकुलर इशू तो नहीं मुझे लगता कि ऐसा कोई इशू है जिस पे कार्य करना सबसे ज्यादा जरूरी है अगले आने वाले समय में पर मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि दो चीजें हैं जो मैं बहुत ही स्ट्रॉन्गली अंदर से फील करती हूँ एक ऐसा है कि हम क्या काम करेंगे जिस जो आगे युवा पीढ़ी है उसको आगे बढ़ने के लिए और फ्रंट लाइन पे जाने के लिए अपने सारे टूल्स और वेपन्स के साथ वो सबसे ज़्यादा इम्पोर्टेंट है क्योंकि भारत सबसे ज़्यादा युवा हमारे देश में है तो अगर कोई भी नीति हम बनाते हैं तो उसमें वो युवाएँ युवा जितने ज़्यादा साथ में हों वो ज़्यादा ज़रूरी है और दूसरा मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि पूरी दुनिया भर में मैं जहाँ जहाँ हम देखें सबसे ज़्यादा जो क्या बोल सकते हैं आपको पॉजिटिव तरीके से जो पहलका मच रहा है वो इस दुनिया की औरतें मचा रही हैं चाहे वो यूएस हो चाहे वो इंडिया हो चाहे वो अर्जेंटीना हो चाहे वो ब्राज़ील हो बहुत सारी जगह है तो मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि औरतें डिफाइन करेंगी इसका फ्यूचर तो जो भी मुद्दा हो उनके साथ और उनके बारे में हो वो बहुत ज़रूरी है तो ये मेरा आपका लिस्ट होगा और क्योंकि आपने टेक्नोलॉजी की बात की हम टेक्नोलॉजी जनरेशन में रहते हैं तो मुझे लगता है कि वो उसके साथ साथ चलती रहे जैसे कि आपने सो जैसे कि आपने पूछा कि कौन सा मुद्दा एक मुद्दा नहीं है मेरी नज़र में बट एक ऐसी चीज है जिच वी हैव टू वर्क ऑन दैट इज बहुत छोटा सा वर्ड है जिसकी वजह से हम यहाँ पे बैठे हैं दैट इज कम्पैशन तो वो कम्पैशन कोई भी सेक्टर आप ले लो पुलिस ले लो लॉयर्स ले लो आ, कोई भी सोशल इम्पैक्ट कोई कोई चीज़ है अगर हम उसको ट्रेन नहीं करते हैं लाइक like कोई साइकोलॉजिस्ट है उस वो जब अपनी ड्यूटीज अपनी सर्विसेज स्टार्ट करता है वो एक दिन कम्पैशन के साथ काम करता है काफ़ी रिलेट करता है एक महीना करेगा उसके बाद वो इम्यून हो जाता है जिससे वो अपनी सर्विसेज नहीं दे पाता और मेनली सेक्टर जो पुलिस सेक्टर्स है लॉयर सेक्टर्स हैं मेरा क्वेश्चन ये नहीं है कि आ, क्या काम हो रहा है या क्या काम होता है आ, मेरा क्वेश्चन ये है कि किस थीम पे हम लोग काम कर रहे हैं कि आज़ादी के बाद किस थीम पे काम करना चाहिए था कि और हम थोड़ा सा और मोटिवेट मो, होते लोगों से या फिर और हम बेहतर कर पाते अब बेहतर है लेकिन और बेहतर बनने की प्रयास कर पाते क्या तो दैट इज़ फाइन अभी मैंने मतलब इन द बिगिनिंग आई मैंशन कि ये मुद्दा नहीं है एक बहुत छोटी सी चीज़ है एक बहुत छोटी सी चीज़ है जिसकी वजह से हम बहुत पीछे जा रहे हैं और इस चीज़ पे एक्सरसाइज करना लाइक लाइक द कंट्रीज लाइक इन इंग्लैंड ये कंपैशन पे एक एक्स्ट्रा क्लासेस लेते हैं एक्स्ट्रा स्ट्रक्चर फ्रेम आउट करते हैं कंपनीज में ताकि हम अपनी जॉब के लिए ज़्यादा रिस्पॉन्सिबल फील करें और एक क्योंकि एक बेटर सिटीजन ही एक बेटर वर्ल्ड और बेटर नेशन बनाता है थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच Uh, for just facilitating that discussion right there and just you know responding to each other um i think uh, we haven't heard nitish at all and we would really nimish i'm so sorry i keep mixing it up uh we we've, we've ha- heard all the change makers but nimish is here and we don't want to miss out on his story so please nimish um uh, if in just a couple of minutes you can just yes. share your journey uh, hi everyone uh, hi everyone uh, i'm nimish i'm totally not prepared so i'll just say what comes to my mind so uh, thanks a lot to rupinder for contacting me for doing the ppc so uh, it was uh, uh, because of ppc i would call this year a watershed year for me so uh, my project is on environment so environment so there are a lot of people working on various projects on environment so mine relates to circular economy so uh, everybody that i sp- uh, spoke to so nobody knows about circular economy so in other people know it in other words which is called sustainability but uh, sust- when we talk of sustainability it mainly talks about uh, undoing the harm that has already happened to the environment however when we talk of circular economy we try to integrate the industrialization and uh, uh, then uh, help the environment so uh, if i have to explain circular economy 
Currently, our economy works on a model where we produce, we consume, and we throw away. It happens with every small thing that we have here. We produce, we consume, we throw away. However, that's not the way nature works. In nature, things get produced, they get consumed. After that, they get recycled or reused. So, can we do that in in our economy? Can we? So, instead of uh, buying this laptop, so the Apple will make this laptop. We consume this laptop for five years. and before the technology gets obsolete the apple takes back the laptop reuses all the possible parts in new laptops and uh, the chain continues so we'll have uh, less of landfills we'll have less of garbage on our streets and we'll be able to uh, less utilize the natural resources uh, in across the world so that's uh, what my project is about so uh, i don't exactly have a ground community uh, but there are a lot of stakeholders in the model so there is government there are recyclers there are people across india who would want to give back their things uh, so a lot of stuff so uh, that's it so thanks a lot so this program has really uh, made me think on a lot of things i have uh, zoomed out and looked at various stakeholders what kind of expectations they would have and how can i go about further uh, strengthening this cause so that's it thank you thank you okay looks like we have mr amitabh behar with us who is the guest of honor uh, for the day uh, he is the ceo of oxfam india he's passionate about governance accountability social and economic equality and citizen participation over the years he has worked on building people centric campaigns alliances for so for social justice and linking micro activism to macro changes amitabh is one of the leading experts of people centered advocacy and chairs organizational boards of amnesty international india navsarjan and yuva he is the vice board chair of civicus and also sits on the board of other organizations like center for budget and governance accountability mobile crash varni a global fund for community foundation everybody please please welcome amitabh <laughs> I would, I would really like you to come and share few words with us, something that we've all been waiting for in the evening. So please do join us. That's really coming into the cold. Yeah. <laughs> so would you just speak to me for a minute in terms of what's happening? Yes, of yes, course, I'm of happy. course. <laughs> yes. So. we've had uh, we've we've had like a brief introduction of the program and we showed like a wonderful video which we'd also shared with you about like what this program has been about uh, and essentially uh, have all our change makers the 11 change makers who've been uh, ta- who've taken this three month journey with us uh, talk about their stories their projects uh, what is it that they learned and how have how have things transformed from the, uh, for them uh, we also had uh, kathleen as well as aprajita give their speeches and talk about you know why is it so important for us to make sure that community is a part of that process uh, that people are at the center uh, of any change making decision and the fact that when we take these decisions it's no long it's, it's not about those plans but it's about the dream we want people to join us on bringing them together on that vision so that's what we've been talking about and we've had so, yeah would you would you yeah, like I'm us to play that? okay fantastic yeah so that that's about it that's where we were when okay. we were just discussing yeah. few things yeah yeah no please okay start. thank you and uh, my apologies uh, though i'm i thought i'm not way late i'm 7 8 minutes late so apologies uh, i would have uh, been happier to come in at least get a glimpse of what's happening i assume that english is the preferred language here or should i speak also in hindi some friends kuch sathiyon ko angrezi ki mein samasya hai ye sab ke liye samasya na bhi ho to bhi good to make it okay kuch kuch sathi aise hain shayad shayad jinko hindi mushkil hogi koi baat nahi but when we go there we also okay so so i okay i'll certainly try and mix both um, so i'm i must say that i'm absolutely uh, delighted to be here whatever i heard from aprajita i'm not really aware of the details of the program 
I would be very keen to engage and, and understand how do you do this. Uh, I've had on and off interactions with the J Jindal University over the years now, pretty much from uh, the day one. I've worked closely with uh, Professor Sudarshan, uh, so I'm sure this is an exciting initiative. I just wanted to say a few things. I was thinking, what do I really talk about with uh, change makers who come from across the country? I was told that few of you are from Delhi, but kafi log Madhya Pradesh, uh, Bihar, or uh, Orissa. So, alag alag uh, context se yahan aaye hue hain. So, just two three thoughts from my side, and I'm happy to then have a, a conversation depending on the time we have. So, the the first that I would say is uh, one of the, the most fascinating phrases that I've learned in the last one year or so is uh, the idea of constitutional morality. Uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, grappled with it, but this was not a phrase that we used in this country often. What is the morality of Indian constitution? And I've been now saying that we need to push ourselves and it's really not the morality of the Indian constitution. It is the morality of Indian Republic. And what is that fundamental morality of Indian Republic? That's something that needs to be understood. I do personally feel that it's under threat. Uh, it's been under threat for a fairly long time. It certainly got accentuated in the last few years. With I, I have no hesitation in saying with the current regime. That's how I look at it. Uh, where the fundamentals of this country, which we thought was going to be a secular, diverse, plural country, is now under threat. So I, I think that's the most critical piece. Uh, if you say that you are ready to live for someone who is ready to live for someone, then I can't articulate it. But this is what I think is the most critical piece. I, mean, I have certainly grown up with this idea of India. And I hold this idea of very, very dear to me. I assume many others would. But uh, the message that I wanted to share is that I'm sure, and, and, and because I truly believe in pluralism, I do understand that people can have different moral compasses. But the life has to be around a moral compass. That is the most critical piece that I think we need to identify. So I'm sure you've identified that and that's what brings you here. But moving ahead, how do you sharpen that moral compass? And I feel very, very um, angry at times when I cross from uh, the Bombay airport, which I do often, to the city center, which is which is called the Fort area. Bombay wale wo और वहाँ पर एक बहुत बदसूरत सी बिल्डिंग क्रॉस करना पड़ता है, जिसका नाम है एंटिलिया। <laughs> तो इस देश में जब मुझे 40 फोरो की एक इमारत नजर आती है, जिसमें चार लोग रहते हैं और कहते ये हैं कि वो चार लोग भी नहीं रहते क्योंकि वास्तु ने कहा कि उनको नहीं रहना चाहिए वहाँ पर। और उसी के आसपास in informal settlements. That's the level of inequality. So that's certainly not my moral compass. Uh, and I feel angry about it. What will I do about changing this inequality is my critical question. So I just wanted, you know, to, to say that let's be very, very clear about our moral compass. I wanted to share my moral compass. One way I did was to talk of the Indian constitution, the Indian Republic. The other is to be far more upfront, as in, I will give you two examples. One is, I have already said that I was in uh, university in the late 80s and early 90s. Then we were talking about the Samajik Nyayi. तब वो समय नहीं आया था जब हम लोगों को ये करने की जरूरत थी कि हम सेक्युलरिज्म को डिफेंड करें था ही नहीं वो सवाल नहीं था इट वाज अ गिवन एंड एंड ऑन 6 दिसंबर 1992 
I woke up to a root shock. I really thought that would have never happened in my country when I saw the Babri Masjid getting demolished. I was fairly confident that, yeah, this, this whole mobilization will happen, but eventually the Indian state will not let the, the mosque get demolished. But that happened. Then you had the Atal Bihari Vyajpayi era, where we started defending secularism. And it's, it's, I find it depressing that now the phrase secularism is not an issue for, for debate. It's gone from the main political narrative. Now we are saying, what is nationalism? So I, I can't stand up politically and say, this is about secularism. Uh, so, so that's one way the moral compass has changed. I, I'm just trying to po point out things which have changed dramatically and I feel uncomfortable. Uh, angry about. Uh, the second is the idea of, I talked of social justice. So social justice when, when I was growing up was a critical conversation. But, but in the times of neoliberalism, in the times of Montek Manmohan Singh's uh, liberalization that we all celebrate, gradually the idea of social justice, in fact we would use the phrase, Ab kitne log sunte hai isko, redistributive justice. Uh, it's important where we are saying redistributive justice. It, it means a particular way of development. So redistribution ko the sawali nahi hai. From there we move to a question of exclusion and inclusion in the, uh, uh, the Manmohan Singh era. And now we are, as in I am part of the problem I, I would say as Oxfam. Globally we are saying inequality as if only obscene inequality is unacceptable. Uh, otherwise, we don't need to change the structural causes of injustice, discrimination. So again, I, I'm just saying that for me, the idea of redistributive justice is still central. That's my moral compass. I'm sure you have your own moral compass, so I've spent quite some time on this. But, but you know, let's not get bogged down by the current dominant public narratives. Whatever our moral compass is, I think our entire, as in, in terms of where we move on, on a day when you're completing your a particular interesting course, I think that is really what needs to be defined. And what you do, how you do, you and I can have many conversations. I'm privileged to be in multiple networks. I can give you some ideas, you'll give me some ideas. But those are smaller tactical questions. The larger question is, how do we look at what our North Star is? So, so that was one set of conversation. The second is, uh, I think what you've said, but let, I'll try and, and finish with that and happy to respond to any questions. That essentially, uh, is again, part of the moral compass for me is also a democratic society. And democracy at the moment again is under tremendous threat and you see this not just in India uh, whether you go to Trump land that's what you see uh, whether you go to uh, Turkey whether you go to Philippines so it's, it's happening across where the idea and the ideals of democracy are getting subverted unfortunately by the same uh, democratic means of elections. So in this, what's also happening is that people are losing faith in the idea of democracy. That's, that's my reading. And that is the reason of the immense amount of spontaneous social movements that we see around the world. So whether it was the Occupy movement, whether the movement that we saw here, I don't know if some of you were part of it, whether it was the India against corruption, whether it was as in when Nirbhaya happened, I think Prajita and I were having a conversation a few weeks ago. I think when that happened, the, the organized civil society was not there. The feminist movement, so to speak, was not there. It was spontaneous. It was people's anger. So there is this narrative of uh, people's anger, which I think is very, very critical. We need to engage with it. But what we also need to do is preserve democracy. You cannot then let this anger uh, take the discourse away. What we saw, say, in, with uh, 
द अरब स्प्रिंग उसके बाद सडनली यू सी इस्लामिक ब्रदरहुड एंड एंड द एंटायर रिवोल्यूशन हैज एक्चुअली कोलेप्सड सो हाउ डू वी एंगेज विद द आइडिया ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी हाउ डू वी मेक इट मोर सब्सटैंडिव इज क्लियर एज इन द वे डेमोक्रेसी इज इवॉल्ड पहले कहते थे कि हमारे यहाँ के बड़े पार्लियामेंट वॉज अ रिप्रजेंटेटिव ऑफ द फ्यूडल एंड द प्राइवेट कैपिटल ग्रेजुअली यू सी दे दम सेल्व एक्चुअली एंटरिंग विजय मलया वॉज एक्चुअली सिटिंग इन साइड द पार्लियामेंट ऑब्वियसली पीपल विल लूज फेथ नॉट जस्ट अ विजय मलया देन यू हैव द अंबानी के जो खास आदमी होते थे मैं नाम भूल रहा हूँ नहीं जो जो मंत्री भी थे पत्रकार और शुक्ला शुक्ला नाम है उनका राजीव सो सो दीज आर पीपल एज एवरीबडी इज नोन दैट देव बीन पार्ट ऑफ ऑफ द कॉर्पोरेट हाउस इज रिप्रेजेंटिंग दोज दोज इंटरेस्ट सो इन दिस वॉट इज द रोल ऑफ सिविल सोसाइटी एंड आई सेट आई यूजली टॉक ऑफ फोर फाइव रोल्स but i'll talk of two roles because that's what i think is critical uh, the two roles that uh, i talk of one is uh, to make power accountable to kaise hum satta ko jawab de banaye aur har tarah ki satta chahe wo pitra satta ho chahe wo brahminism ho chahe wo हिंदुत्व की सत्ता हो और आम तौर पर तो वो फ्यूडल सत्ता होती है सो एनी बडी हुज प्लीज लेट मी ऑल्सो बी क्लियर आई थिंक दैट यूपी ऑल्सो हैड ह्यूज प्रॉब्लम्स सो इट्स नॉट दैट यूपीए के समय आदिवासी लगातार डिस्प्लेस होते थे यूपीए के समय ही uh, हम लोगों ने बस्तर में एट्रॉसिटीज uh, देखी हैं तो ऐसा नहीं है एक और जुड़ गया है उसमें बड़ी समस्या माइनॉरिटी राइट्स का और अलग से हनन हो रहा है सो दर इज बीन अ फंडामेंटल प्रॉब्लम विथ द द पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज सो आई वाज आई वाज सेइंग दैट हाउ डू वी मेक पावर अकाउंटेबल दैट इज रियली आर फंडामेंटल क्वेश्चन एंड वी मस्ट वर्क ऑन इट अगेन वेदर यू डू इट थ्रू मीडिया थ्रू थ्रू सोशल मीडिया थ्रू लॉ थ्रू वॉट but i i think it's critical our job is to make power accountable and 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 you know people like i think gandhi uh, were essentially talking about making power accountable that's that's one of the central thesis that i see of uh, uh, gandhi's work and the second maybe i've i've been very grim today uh, it's it's suddenly dusk and so maybe it's, it's the other i think is which only comes from civil society i'm convinced that the ideas of change come only from the margins ideas of change do not come from the center ideas of change are not going to come from islamic center or the lutons delhi or central delhi it's going to come from whether it is jhabua in madhya pradesh whether it is uh, uh, mendhak in andhra pradesh it is going to come from different parts from people who are living on the margins दे आर दन सुनो उनमें तड़प है बदलाव की और वो बदलाव लाते हैं एंड दैट्स वॉट सिविल सोसाइटी इज अगेन फॉर सो जो आपने कहा आई थिंक सो दैट्स सो क्रिटिकल दैट सिविल सोसाइटी इज ऑल्सो अबाउट ऑल्टरनेटिव सिविल सोसाइटी इज ऑल्सो अबाउट ड्रीम्स सो इट इज रियली अबाउट कंटिन्यूइंग टू ड्रीम सो लेट मी एंड विथ कपलेट विच इफ आई आई होप आई गेट इट राइट अशोक वाजपेयी का नाम शायद आप लोग जानते होंगे मैंने ही इज़ अ ग्रेट क्रिटिक बट ही ऑल्सो डज पोइट्री मैं आई ग्रेजुअली रियलाइज पीपल नो हिम मोर एज अ क्रिटिक बट ही इज़ ऑल्सो अ पोइट एंड ही सेट समथिंग वेरी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग इन द कॉन्टेक्सट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड सोशल फोरम एंड ही सेट या ट्रूथ इन यूथ दोज हु डू नॉट ड्रीम truth eludes those who do not dream because truth is born out of dreams and mind you he was also speaking in the indian context where truth is also god so aapko usko par se aap jab tak sapne nahi dekhenge kyun unka tha ki sapne unhe nahi milte 
सॉरी सच उन्हें नहीं मिलता जो सपने नहीं देखते क्योंकि सप, सपनों का जन सच का जन सपनों में ही होता है थैंक यू एंड ऑल द वेरी बेस्ट question uh, that's your opinion and uh, i agree with your opinion that it is critical that people who have influence uh, do stand by shoulder to shoulder with people who are really uh, at the forefront of struggles so absolutely yes that needs to be done uh, and you're right that a lot of times a lot of people do not come forward and that is also because of the climate of fear that you see so a lot of organizations are extremely worried about their fcrs how will they function and so on so that the government wants that that the government wants it certainly wants that and and that so i'm just saying that you need to also understand why which organization is not coming forward this is not to condone uh, uh, what they're doing uh, but uh, different people will hopefully if they truly believe in the idea of human rights and and strengthening human rights defenders they'll find mechanisms of supporting uh, people who are at the forefront and that's absolutely critical without solidarity we'll not be able to move yes. it 
that I'm convinced as in what we really need is solidarity the more the size of the organization grows uh, the ability of that organization to make a decisive shift particularly in edgy issues decreases it's it's individuals who can make that change but the idea of these organizations is they've created their organizational muscle so that they're able to provide support to these people so what you're saying in principle is absolutely right in practice also it does happen it's not that there are not many groups who do not support uh, but absolutely we, sh we should do that reach out to me I, I'm uh, I'm always available I do multiple so things is there any such way to so there are multiple networks, as in, so she's very strict with her time, <laughs> but uh, there are multiple networks. So, uh, like, uh, uh, I've moved out of the amnesty chair's role, not because what's happening there. We're going through a really tough time, as in, we need solidarity now. Uh, the way uh, the enforcement directorate came into our office, says, you know, just, just was, I was, what I was talking about, the, we went to the court, the court said, you cannot freeze the accounts. The Indian courts have already said that. That doesn't come on page one. Uh, and the enforcement directorate is not even uh, unfreezing our accounts. So next week we're going to go and say that this is contempt of court. But what it really means is that we can't function. But sorry, that's, that's uh, uh, off tangent. But entities like whether it's, uh, say, the amnesty or whether you have the, because you work on RTI, you have the national campaign on the RTI. So that's, you have a group of human rights defenders. So there are multiple networks uh, which you could connect with. I am familiar with so many networks. You will have to. At the yeah. end of the hour, there will be That is my concern. Sure, so you, you, you can, so you can uh, reach out to me. And I, you know, I, you, you're right. A lot of times people at the forefront do feel that the support they need, and not just they feel, the support that's really needed is not made available to them. So that does happen. For instance, I was talking about Bastar. So just, just imagine what has been happening in, in Bastar and Chhattisgarh. That's an area I know better. Uh, there are few lawyers and journalists working from that region. Uh, and, and they just, you know, the cops just go and say, they don't give them a home for them. So forget about physical threats, they could not uh, live in those uh, areas. And what we did a solidarity letter sitting in Delhi, again assembled somewhere in central Delhi, Constitution Club, mein jama ho hum log. Uh, that maybe at, for the local real activist was not enough. And they've had to leave that uh, uh, region. So you're you're right, as in we we must step up. Resources like they can offer the services of the lawyer that can make a real. Uh, again, so, so the <laughs> lawyers do come <laughs> forward. <laughs> so I, I will just say lawyers do come forward. I completely hear you. It is extremely inadequate, and we need to step it up. It up. Yeah. There's no doubt on that. Yeah. Yeah, and I would really encourage that you take forward this discussion uh, as we you know break out from here. Because I'm sure, just like you, many other people have similar questions to ask. And, and yeah, probably we don't have answers to those questions. But this is where we begin, you know, by asking more and more of those questions is when we start figuring out the way. Um, and it's so important because it only begins with conversations. So let's, let's make sure we have time for those conversations uh, and move on to the last part. It takes us back to the need to, you know, keep doing this work to keep innovating, to keep bringing different experts and stakeholders such as all of you. And also the fact that we have so much to offer, right? And that we can't stop, we, can, we must not stop because today's world, it demands us to come together. It demands us to combine our efforts and to have big wins. So thank you so much. This is just the start and I, I imagine us to continue working with the same energy and enthusiasm and keep going from here. I would just now like to call Rupinder on stage. And for, you know, the vision which you created, uh, we all totally agree when you spoke about democracy by margins because 
at the PPC program, we actually believe that it is a people-powered center change which needs to happen so as to have, you know, real social change on the ground. And that's what the journey of these 11 change makers has been in all these 10 weeks, uh, where they've learned how they have to involve their community, go and talk to them about their problems and, you know, have solutions from them. Thank you so much to Caitlin for sharing her story and inspiring all of us here. Aprajita for setting that vision, not only for the chain makers, but for all of us here at Haya also. Jeremy, by inspiring us that why is he here uh, in India to create that impact. And all of you who've been here with us in this three months of this journey, our um, videographer, Nishant, who couldn't come, who created this fabulous video for us, India Islamic Center. And we would certainly be hosting the second PPC next year. And we'll be opening another space for all change makers uh, next in January. And we would certainly like to have more of change makers come and join us and join the movement and join you know, change making. Thank you so much. Uh, it's now open for uh, networking and hi tea, as Natasha had said. And we would like all of you to ask questions from Mr. Amitabh Bahar, Jeremy, Gitlin, and please network and spread your ideas. Good evening. Thank you.